IPS Director Mr. Janadas Devan will now give the opening remarks. Minister Joseph Infio, friends and colleagues, welcome to Diversities New and Old. The title is self-explanatory. We have various sessions today addressing the diversity arising from income inequality, new social, social formations, and politics. I think we have a stellar cast of speakers and interviewers. I won't say much to frame today's conference, for I can't improve on what DPM Tarman said last night. I will instead make three unrelated points that might serve as signposts in our discussions. And I'll do so mainly by quoting what other people have said. Let me begin with how the word meritocracy arose. We bandy it about as though it has no history. The word was in fact coined by Michael Young, the British sociologist and major Labour Party intellectual, one among the brains trusts that did much of the intellectual heavy lifting that led to the creation of the British welfare state following the post-war victory of the Labour Party in the 1945 general elections, the British general election. Those post-war reforms did not only create the cradle-to-grave welfare state, it also opened pathways to success for all, especially through education. University education was no longer the preserve of aristocrats. Scholarship boys and girls, including many from working class families, were admitted to the best colleges based solely on their merit, not their family origins. The reforms that idealists like Michael Young helped put in place gave rise to a new aristocracy. In a 1958 satire, Young called this new class the meritocracy. The meritocracy Young wrote was determined by the formula IQ plus effort equals merit. As Anthony Kwame Appiah wrote in a first-rate piece on Michael Young in the October 11th edition of the New York Review of Books, a piece I recommend all of you read, as Anthony wrote, Michael Young's cautions have, of course, proved well-founded. In the United States, the top fifth of households enjoyed a $4 trillion increase in pre-tax income between 1979 and 2013, a trillion dollars more than came to all the rest. When increased access to higher education was introduced in the United States and Britain, it was seen as a great equalizer. But a couple of generations later, researchers tell us that higher education is now a great stratifier. Economists have found that many elite institutions, universities, including Brown, Dartmouth, Penn, Princeton, and Yale, take more students from the top 1% of the income distribution from the bottom 60%. To achieve a position in the top tier of wealth, power, and prestige, in short, it helps enormously to start there. American meritocracy, the Yale law, law professor Daniel Markowitz argues, has become precisely what it was invented to combat, a mechanism for the dynastic transmission of wealth and privilege across generations, unquote. In other words, meritocracy, like the aristocracy it succeeded, has become hereditary. Let me now turn to my second signpost. This comes from Yuval Noah Harari's uh, latest book, 21 Lessons in the 21st Century. Again, something I recommend very highly. There is nothing inevitable about democracy, Harari notes. For all the success the democracies have had over the past century or more, they are blips in history. In the second half of the 21st century, liberalism has begun to lose credibility, he says. Why? Simply because the technology that favored democracy is changing. Infotech and biotech will create unprecedented upheavals in human society, 
eroding human agency and possibly subverting human desires. Under such conditions, liberal democracy and free market economics might become obsolete. In two chilling paragraphs, Harari writes, in 2018, the common person feels increasingly irrelevant. Lots of mysterious terms are bandied about excitedly in TED talks at government think tanks and at high-tech conferences, globalization, blockchain, genetic engineering, AI, machine learning. And common people, both men and women, may well suspect that none of these terms is about them. In the 20th century, Harari continues, the masses revolted against exploitation and sought to translate their vital role in the economy into political power. Now, the masses fear irrelevance, and they are frantic to use their remaining political power before it is too late. Brexit and the rise of Donald Trump may therefore demonstrate a trajectory opposite to that of traditional socialist revolutions. The Russian, Chinese, and Cuban revolutions were made by people who were vital to the economy but lacked political power. In 2016, Trump and Brexit were supported by many people who still enjoyed political power but feared they were losing their economic worth. Perhaps in the 21st century, populist revolts will be staged not against an economic elite that exploits people, but against an economic elite that does not need them anymore. This may well be a losing battle. It is much harder to struggle against irrelevance than against exploitation." Unquote. This is a profound point which merits deep consideration. What are we going to do about it? There is no simple answer. If there were, we would, not, we would know the answer by now. But let me go back to the writings of the man who coined the term meritocracy for my third signpost. Significantly, Michael Young, a socialist, did not think the solution was to eradicate meritocracy. Not possible, he pointed out. One, because every system needs to sort out people by their abilities and aptitudes. It is not possible to have a skilled barber do open heart surgery, or rather possible but not advisable. Two, every system needs a structure of incentives to ensure the right people are incentivized to do particular jobs and get things done. Now, neither of these points means the top 1% of families should command as many places at Yale as the bottom 60%, or the top 1% of families should earn on average 26.3 times as much income as the bottom 99% as they do in the United States. These figures are obscene and one can't defend such outcomes. But the essential point that Young made remains. A system filtered by some kind of sorting based on abilities and aptitudes, in other words, merit, will inevitably result in some sort of system that distributes rewards unequally. Inequality of some degree is inevitable. But society shouldn't confuse economic worth with moral worth. Young envisaged a society that both possessed and acted upon plural values, including kindliness, courage, and sensitivity, so all had a chance to develop his own special capacities for leading a rich life. The economic rewards of wealth are inevitably going to be unequally shared. But that shouldn't mean, should not mean, dignity and respect for the special capacities of each and every life should also be unequally distributed. This is a point that DPM Parman, I think, made eloquently yesterday. But adding that without economic growth to keep that social ladder or escalator moving, it'll be very difficult to confer respect and dignity to every life, regardless of job, position, or education. All this may sound rather ideolo idealistic, if not exotic, and it is, but the idealism points to why we must take wealth and income inequality so seriously. In our case, what is at stake is our continued existence as a nation. A Singapore divided against itself by class cannot stand. 
And the same point might be made too of all the other diversities, new and old, we have to live with. Differences have to be accepted and very often celebrated. Plurality of cultures, religions, life choices, political beliefs is a virtue. Without contraries, there is no progression. But there is also that other equally urgent imperative. We have to stick together. How do you make out of many one? We're not going to settle on the answers in a one-day conference, but I trust we will get somewhere. Beginning with our first session with the Minister for Manpower, Josephine Thieu, and the NTU economist and newly appointed NMP, Walter Tessera. May I invite it both to the stage. Thank you.